There we go. There we go. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you may know me from previous videos. My name is Joe Anderson, and I'm the research director at Phonolytics. And I am joined today by Jaying, who will introduce herself a little bit. Hi, I'm Jaying. Um, I'm the lead researcher at Good Growth. Uh, we do user and market research on farm animal welfare and alternative proteins in Asia. And um, occasionally we support partners like Phonolytics when they want to do research in this region. And we were very lucky to have Jaying and Good Growth helping out with this project, uh, really taking the lead on it. So I'm going to start off today by talking a little bit about the rationale behind the study and the method that we used. And then Jaying will talk for a bit about the key findings and we'll cover some recommendations as well. So first, uh, just to start it off, uh, what we did for this study was a set of focus groups. So small groups of participants, um, about four or five people per group who would talk amongst themselves about the questions that we had prepared for them. And we had 40 people all together and split them into those groups based on their demographics. So for instance, we had a group of fathers, a group of mothers, grandparents, single adults, university students, and then some different income groups. So obviously any given person could be in more than one of those groups, but the way that we assigned them was by those demographics so that hopefully they would have something a bit more in common with the other people in the group to talk about. And this study uh, was focused on Chinese consumer attitudes. So as you would imagine, um, it was conducted in China and the groups were done in Mandarin Chinese by a data collection company that we hired, uh, but Jiaying was there as well in attendance to help out. And in terms of what we asked about, some of the early questions in these focus groups were focused around people's meat consumption habits. And then we kind of segued into questions about animal welfare and farm animal welfare in particular to get a sense of just whether they thought about those things and what they think about them. And then in more of a gauging reactions kind of way, we went to ask them about, or rather we exposed them to different types of media that are used for advocacy purposes, sort of explaining some of the issues involved around animal welfare and gauging reactions to them. And then after that, uh, we have all that data transcribed uh, into written form and Jiaying led the thematic analysis of the results uh, with support from her colleague at Good Growth, Jack Stennett. So thanks to Jack. Um, and basically what that means is going through all of that data, all of that transcript information systematically and pulling out commonalities between what people said, differences, and interpreting what they've said in order to get an understanding of what sort of those underlying general ideas that people have are about these topics. And just to get a sense of what those ideas are, I will turn it over now to Jiaying to talk a little bit about some of the findings. Cool. Thanks, Joe. So some of the key findings, um, let's start with the first one, which is uh, that Chinese consumers are interested in higher welfare products. So we found that many participants either mentioned having tried or being interested in trying higher welfare products. Um, but most of this was justified uh, in terms of benefits, in terms of like quality um, and food safety rather than animal welfare directly. Um, I guess some of the reasons that we heard uh, for choosing higher welfare products was that they are tastier and more fragrant when they're being cooked, um, while lower quality products are often associated with um, concerns like animals being raised in unsanitary conditions, uh, the use of hormones, antibiotics, and GM products on farms. Um, a second key finding was that most participants were receptive to the idea of animal welfare after watching an explanatory video that we shared with them. Um, although there, at the beginning, there was some confusion about the concept of animal welfare, um, thinking that it was more than um, about like basic standards of care, or even we had one person who like thought that it was related to social welfare, like human social welfare. Um, but after we showed them this short video that explained animal welfare using concepts from the Five Freedoms Framework, most re participants actually reacted quite positively, um, and especially uh, seemed to relate around uh, the ideas on reducing cruelty, um, allowing animals to live according to their natural 
desires, um, and also reducing anti antibiotic use on farms. Uh, finally, we also found that there were several nuances in how consumers think about um, the reasons for consuming meat. Uh, so one kind of umbrella concept might be health, but we found that this actually um, depended on um, one, like what type uh, of meat or animal that they're talking about. Um, and it can also depend on the life stage of, a, of the person. So a concrete example would be that um, beef is often considered good for a children's growth, like especially during puberty, but then it might be bad for older people or people with certain health conditions. Um, another nuance was uh, around um, sensations of consumption. So often we talk about taste, but there were also other concepts like fragrance, mouthfeel, and the feeling of fillingness. Um, that was also important to Chinese consumers. Um, with that, I'll turn back to Joe for uh, some recommendations. Thanks. So we divided up our recommendations in this report into a few different types, um, which we sometimes do with our research and other times it's not necessary. In this particular case, uh, the findings kind of came out into three sets of recommendations. So uh, we can talk a little bit about recommendations for advocates or just people who want to help protect animals in China, um, and then also for alt protein companies and even other researchers. So in terms of advocates, um, this follows kind of naturally from the key findings that Jai Ying was just talking about, but we really recommend that you start, at least start the conversation by talking about health, food quality, and food safety. Those were the concepts that really seemed to resonate with consumers and to already be something that they're thinking about regularly when they're purchasing products. So in order to just get that conversation started, those are a good way to do that, to, to appeal to something that they're already interested in. Um, and in terms of the demographics, this, this study, like I mentioned, we had conversations, focus groups with a range of different demographics. And uh, two of the more receptive ones uh, seem to be moms and grandparents. So people who have younger children of their own or grandchildren. Um, and what we found there was that, uh, as Jiaying mentioned, there were different health concerns for different people and they can get very specific. And with people with children, it's they tend to believe that meat is necessary for children's growth. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest trying to change that belief at the outset, but instead they do have, they spend a lot of time thinking about what's going to be good for their children, healthy for their children. And if we can make the case that reducing meat consumption and incorporating more plant-based options is a healthy and safe alternative, then that seems like it could be a good avenue to pursue. And finally, uh, again, just bringing this back to that idea of animal welfare as a term being a bit problematic in China, that it just doesn't translate the way we would like it to. Um, so it can have some misleading connotations if you take English materials and just translate them uh, to Chinese for use. Uh, so rather than, than trying to do that, we suggest that if you are going to talk about concepts around animal welfare, that you instead focus on those five freedoms uh, that animals should have, uh, specifically freedom from hunger, thirst, freedom to exhibit natural behaviors, those sorts of things, um, and state those things specifically because that's the only way to really convey clearly what we actually mean when we're talking about animal welfare. So back over to Jai Ying. Um, yeah, so on the uh, alternative protein side, given the nuances that I mentioned about um, different considerations uh, when thinking about meat consumption, um, alternative protein companies might want to pay attention to these sort of specific um, concepts that are that go beyond taste. So on the health side, um, this might uh, you might want to mention uh, things such as protein content, uh, fatty acid content, and reduced anti antibiotic use. Um, but even then, we still need to consider uh, tailoring that to different consumer groups and demographics, um, like we've mentioned before, depending on their age, their health conditions, and so forth. Uh, another part would be on the sensation. So again, ideas around mouthfeel, fragrance, um, and just like physical sensations of eating meat uh, seem to be important when 
trying to design both the product and the marketing um, for alternative protein products and to stress that they are maybe comparable or competitive um, with their, their meat, uh, animal meat, animal meat counterparts. So, and then on the researcher side, um, I think it would be valuable to conduct uh, some further testing of some of the more promising ideas that we found in the study. Uh, so for example, on the messaging side, so we actually found kind of pulling on concepts from the five freedoms framework seem to be effective um, and people seem to be receptive to that. And on the other hand, we also found um, kind of messages around like food quality and safety also seems to resonate. So maybe um, testing these two narratives to see which one might work better. And perhaps it actually different, like it's different for different demographics and different groups as well. Uh, finally, um, it might be interesting for researchers to also partner with advocates to test um, sort of <clears throat> panels that we found. Uh, so we identified a number of online platforms that uh, people were using to receive um, information that may be more related to animals. Um, television was also mentioned, and a number of different events were also mentioned um, that that consumers are already attending and maybe good places to target them. Um, this could like range from like medical lectures in the community to farm visits uh, to sporting events and food events. Um, and maybe thinking about how to combine some of the current work from advocates and the channels that consumers are already using might be uh, a more effective way of reaching them and engaging them. Awesome. So at this point, uh, we're going to take a look at some of the questions for this study. So we have a few that were pre-submitted, and if you have any more that are coming to mind right now, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, first question that I have is, how generalizable are these results? I'm never sure what to make of this kind of research where it says the results aren't necessarily representative. Um, that's a great question, and it's it's qualitative research that, that you're referring to with this question. Uh, so the kind of thing where we have a relatively small group of participants, 40, um, and have these group conversations with them. And yes, you will find that in our report, um, it will say things like results aren't necessarily representative of the general population, um, which can sound like therefore they're not meaningful at all. Um, that's not at all what it means. What it more means is that uh, we can't say for sure that if, uh, you know, four out of 40 people in this particular sample uh, say a particular thing that in the entire Chinese population, we would expect 10%, four out of 40, uh, to say that. that. It's not that kind of representative. The sample is too small for that kind of thing. What we're looking for instead in qualitative research is something called saturation, where you have enough participants that you hit a point where you've heard all of the attitudes that exist in the population. Um, so if you imagine that there's a bunch of different ways that people might relate to the concept of animal welfare, some very negative, some very positive, lots of in between and different types of opinions they might express around it. You want to hit a number of participants where you have been exposed to all of those different viewpoints. There might be some uh, more fringe viewpoints that are very, very infrequently represented in the population that you haven't captured. Uh, but at least all of the major viewpoints should be included in the group that you've sampled. So when we're doing qualitative research like this, and the goal is to get really nuanced discussions going, that's what we're aiming for instead of saying, instead of being able to say something like 10% of people believe such and such thing. I hope that helps. Uh, I think the second question is probably a good one for Jiaying. So Jiaying, what was the most surprising finding from this study? Um, yeah, I think we had several surprises. Um, so, I mean, to give a bit of background, uh, we had some initial assumptions and hypotheses, which were um, based on some conversations that we've previously had with advocates um, that were doing work um, in, in China. So I think like one example would be that the grandparents were actually very receptive uh, to the idea of higher welfare products, that they were already purchasing them. And they had a lot of nuance in terms of um, thinking about, you know, they would know which specific brand um, was good for each animal product um, that they uh 
that they, they should consume, basically. Um, I think this is pretty surprising because I think overall, we often think that it's going to be the younger urban, um, you know, richer demographic and that will be most interested. And almost never do I like hear the idea that my like, grandparents might be promising. Um, so I think that was definitely surprising. Uh, and maybe another one was um, when we were looking at different uh, kind of spokespeople or like people who were sharing messages about um, animal welfare in, in one of the videos that we shared um, out of like all of the different people one like the one that seemed to be most well received was actually um, a young student a high school student um, because she seemed kind of like more trustworthy than maybe some of the celebrities or uh, some of the industry um, players uh, yeah and I guess this is also maybe not one of one of the types of people that we would have expected um, going into the study. So, so I guess um, it's important to also note that uh, again, because we have this is like this is not, like as Joe was talking about the qualitative um, research and some of the constraints of that. Like this, these findings don't necessarily provide definitive evidence um, that these are the most promising groups, um, but it does suggest that uh, we could probably take a closer look at them um, to see if, uh, yeah, some of our assumptions are, are, are warranted. Um, I think another maybe overall surprise to me um, as, a, as a researcher is that actually, um, you know, assumptions from both sort of overseas advocates when we were looking at, like looking at how to operate in China, but also local advocates um, who are already working in China, um, like some of those were also wrong. And I think uh, this really drives home the point that often we just don't always like understand our audiences, even when we're from the same country and culture, and I guess really emphasizes the need to do research and and in some cases, especially qualitative research that offers us this very nuanced understanding um, of the people that we're trying to engage. Absolutely. And just to throw in kind of a surprise of my own as a Westerner, uh, not speaking Chinese myself, uh, I found it really interesting, maybe not surprising, but interesting to see the differences, not just in terminology, that there aren't direct translations from English to Mandarin, for instance, um, that that kind of makes sense to me. But the idea that there are these different aspects of eating and food that are just thought about seemingly to me much more uh, by Chinese consumers than I'm familiar with in here in Canada or in the US. Um, so it's not just terminology, but there's actually seemingly a difference in just the way that people relate to things. Um, and as part of that, we ended up doing a table of concepts, uh, English and Chinese, that you can find on the report page uh, that kind of goes over some of those things so you can get a better sense. But uh, going down a rabbit hole here, so back to the questions. Uh, number three is, if we focus on health and food quality, how will we ever bring the conversation back to animals? Which is a great point, um, because I did mention that recommendation of starting with health and food quality, and presumably, if you're watching this video, uh, you are like us interested in the animals. Um, yes, we do wanna bring the conversation back around to how to help the animals at some point. So health and food quality are, like I said, a starting point, a foot in the door for conversation. Um, and some of that is true in the West as well, but also in China, it seems like Particularly, there's already a lot of thought around health, around food safety, around food quality, um, and the things that are associated with that. So it's a really good starting point, because in order to be able to talk about animal welfare, you have to get somebody to engage in conversation with you in the first place. And talking about things that they care about is the best way to do that. It also aligns well with government priorities uh, toward ensuring public safety and health. Um, and while we're having these conversations, you can include information about animal welfare improvements. So like the study found that people are interested in higher welfare products, it may not be because of the welfare angle, but that's obviously a key part of it. It's right in the name. Um, so they are being exposed to it at the same time, and those conversations are getting started as a result. My feeling, and I am a psychologist by background, my feeling is that it is crucially important 
to reduce the dissonance that people feel. Um, that that meat paradox of you know seeing yourself as an animal lover on the one hand, but also still eating meat. Um, reducing dissonance first by changing consumption patterns. However, you can manage to do that. If that's through a health conversation, public safety conversation, great. Um, any of those things, if it just makes people change their behavior a little bit in a positive direction, gives them more psychological breathing room to think about uh, the animals that are involved and to hopefully start caring more and continuing to engage with those topics so that we can have deeper conversations over time. So that's what I'd say. It's never, it's never a one and done. It's an ongoing conversation and incremental change. Um, but I think that we are moving in the right direction. So I think that is the end of the questions. Um, that being the case, I will just thank you for watching and encourage you to check out the report. There's uh, the top level information is on our website directly. And then there's a link to download the full PDF. Um, and I will just say thank you again so much to Jiaying and Jack for uh, involving good growth, leading this research. It was fantastic to partner us. with you and, and for joining me today. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.